First of all, what a beautiful campus you have here at King. As we were driving in this morning, it, it almost made me want to go back to college again. Almost. Not <laughs> almost. Yeah. Beautiful ball fields and a gorgeous campus. And you're, you're at a great school, and, and I'm envious of uh, this. And you need to take the opportunity that you're given here because what you learn here will be a, a platform. Uh, I, me, personally, I have spent a lifetime of learning. Um, when I graduated from uh, college and medical school, I did uh, two years in the military, 13 months, just 11 miles south of the demilitarized zone in Korea in the 2nd Infantry Division. And those experiences, how many of you have had military backgrounds? Just as a curiosity, so just one. Um, yeah, I, I never intended or ever thought I would be in the U.S. Congress. If somebody would have asked me in 2005 or whatever, uh, would you consider being a congressman or whatever? It would never cross my mind. And so why did I do it? Uh, well, the, the honest answer is I went off my medication after I got to Washington. I sort of found out I should have stayed on my Prozac and stayed where I was. Um, but anyway, I decided to run, and I wrote, the first time I ran, I lost. And I ran a second time in 2008 and won. Um, the reason I did was I was at getting toward the end of a medical, medical career. And this is a phenomenal country. And I had served my country as in the military for two years at the end of Vietnam. And I thought, it's time for me to serve again. Um, I can practice a while longer, or I could, and I knew healthcare was going to be a big issue. And I wanted to be involved in the healthcare debate, which I was. And it didn't turn out like I'd like to afford to have it turned out. But nevertheless, it is the law of the land we're to dealing with it. I serve on two committees in Congress. Uh, one is the Education and Workforce Committee, the other is the Veterans Affairs Committee. Obviously two important committees that affect a lot of the citizens in the country. And the topic today we're going to talk about, I'm going to go through the, uh, um, talk about ISIS and ISIL a little bit, and I didn't have a lot of time to prepare, so this will just be some random thoughts from me. But, uh, last night before I went to bed, I did something that I do not infrequently. I thought, you know, I need to read historically about this. So I read uh, a part of Genesis last night, and I would suggest that you do that. Um, you go back and you read about Abraham, Isaac, Ishmael, Sarah, and Hagar. You begin to understand that this is a long, long thousands of years in the making. And you look at the Middle East, just the layout of it, and I've spent about a month in the Middle East. I've spent uh, 10 days, 12 days in Israel, I've been to Kuwait, Iraq, Afghanistan. I spent about two weeks in Afghanistan. Um, and um, had just recently got back from Vietnam uh, on a trip there about three months ago. Um, that area of the world is to say complicated is an understatement. Uh, it truly is one of the most politically complicated places in the world. Uh, if you look at it historically, that piece of land, and you, you hear it known as ISIS or ISIL. Uh, the ISIL part, and you all know this, have studied this, is called the Levant. And the Levant is just an area. Uh, but it's an area that was Canaan during biblical times, Palestine. Uh, it's been occupied by the Greeks, the Romans, uh, the Jewish people, uh, Muslim people. So it's been occupied for literally centuries by different people. And the Levant area that we're talking about is a part of Lebanon, uh, what is now Palestine or Israel, Jordan, Iraq, Syria, and a little bit of the Sinai. So it's a swath of land. It means land from, that rises from the sea um, is, is the uh, Muslim term for it. It, it was in existence before the Ottoman Empire divided up. And we heard about uh, Aleppo, which is a community, a town in Syria. Well, Aleppo actually was a, a province of the Ottoman Empire. And, and after World War I, it was divided one way, and after World War II, and then divided up where the state of Israel was established. And remember, immediately after the state of Israel was established, there was a war, 1948 war, uh, with Syria, Egypt, Jordan, and, and other countries against Israel, which Israel won. And since that time, there has been, well, it's been conflict forever, but the conflict has basically intensified. I'm going to go back 40 years for you, and I'm going to throw this out there just to think about a little bit. Forty years ago, I was at uh, the DMZ in Korea, just south of it, and there was an oil embargo. 
And at the Middle East at that time, the uh, oil that came out of Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Iran, the Middle East, we were dependent on about 60, 65, 70 percent of our oil was imported from other countries. And basically, OPEC cut it off, cut the oil off. <clears throat> what did that mean to us here? Well, none of you were alive then, but the people who were, in this country, you had to line up every other day to get gasoline. You couldn't get gas every day. It was rationed. But where I was in the military, we only got heat. And I, this is through two Korean winters, three hours a day. So it was so cold, I remember the water would freeze in my canteen. And the hooch, we call it a hooch. It's basically a quantity of it, with about an eighth inch of sheet metal between me and the outside. And why? Well, we had to keep that water for our tanks, our Cobra gunships, our uh, hel other Huey helicopters and others. So we, it was basically for security reasons. And I saw then that we needed a coherent energy policy in this country, and we did not. And, and President Jimmy Carter stated, and probably that's the only thing I'll ever agree with Jimmy Carter on, but uh, I did agree with him on this 100% I did then, I still do today, is that we do not need to import more than 50% of our oil ever into this country. He was absolutely right 35 years ago. Again, no policy. So if you'll look at now, I looked at then, where there was a little Middle Eastern conflict. There were oil rationing and prices went up. Here you have the Middle East blowing up, literally exploding, and oil prices are going down. Well, that can only happen for two reasons. One is demand has gone down it has not, or two, supplies have gone up. And what's happened is this country has become almost energy independent, and certainly can be in the next five or six years without a doubt. But energy independence is basically a strategic, uh, it's basically from a standpoint from where we're looking at, it's a security issue, a huge security issue. It's a jobs issue, and let me tell you what the worst thing that happened to the American people, because I saw it in 2008 when I ran gas prices went to five dollars a gallon it paralyzed this country it made the recession much worse than it otherwise would have been and it, and it affects low-income people and people who live on a fixed income are retired senior citizens the most why is that well because if when they go to the grocery store everything is transported by truck eventually it gets there by truck and those prices are added to it everything we get is affected by the price of oil so right now, we, we, we could be, I said, within the next four or five years, no doubt about the energy independent. We have the largest carbon reserve in the world, and there are federal policies that was mentioned, what can we do? One of the things we can do is to make ourselves more energy independent, and that's an all of the above approach. It's not just uh, coal, natural gas, and oil, but it is wind, solar power, renewables, all of that. And, and I, the record we had when I was on uh, city commission was this Johnson City where I was mayor. We were voted the green city of the state. We won the National EPA Award. When you go on the veterans, the uh, VA hospital campus in Johnson City, that campus is completely heated and cooled by landfill gas. We were just flaming that methane up in the air. Well, right now we're using it, cleaning it up, sending it to the VA, and it's heated and cooled. Your, your veterans are being uh, heated and cooled by that. That's where the energy from that is. So, Think about that when you're thinking about this global. This war with ISIS is not about energy or about oil. Maybe the, the uh, Desert Storm one was when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, set the uh, oil fields on fire. It did affect oil prices around the world. This is not. This is about an idea, and this is a very bad idea. I've been to, a num to numerous classified briefings uh, with General Dempsey, who's the Joint Chiefs of Staff and have seen some horrific footage of what's going on in that area. What these folks want to do, the radical Islamic Muslims, and basically the, uh, the terrorist organizations are all loosely tied together. The, the parent organization was the Muslim Brotherhood back in the 20s. It actually got it started. Now you have Islamic Jihad, uh, Hamas, Al-Qaeda, uh, ISIS. It's, a, it's an alphabet soup of bad guys. Basically, what they want to do is recreate this state, Iran, this area, and the caliphate is a state. Once they've established this Islamic state, which will involve part of Syria and the, the land I told you about, they then want to spread this poison around the world. So the question is, what do you do about it? And we were in Iraq, and you can argue whether we were in Iraq for the right reasons, whether we were in 
and Afghanistan for the right reasons. Um, I'll certainly entertain some questions on that. The question is, we're dealing with, and, and should we have had a status of forces agreement with the uh, Iraqi Prime Minister Maliki, who is not easy to deal with? Uh, we pulled completely out and left a void. Uh, and what happened, I think, uh, let me just, uh, there's only one uh, military uh, person in here, but our military is different than other militaries, and probably the Canadians are like us, and Brits and the Aussies are like us. We train our military to take command from the ground up, and what do I mean by that? Well, in our military, when you're a private, you then become, as you, as you progress, you take on progressive responsibilities. And you may, may then be a squad leader, and then you may be a platoon leader, and then you may be a company commander, and then you may be a battalion commander. You take any of those out of there, that company or squad or whatever continues to function because the next guy steps up and takes over. That's the way we're trained. We're not trained from the top down. The Arab armies are trained from the top down. What Maliki did was he took basically all the Sunni leadership, which what Saddam Hussein was a Sunni, and so all his top military people were Sunnis. They were taken out, and political people were put in. So when ISIS came in, the, the, the leadership ran, and they weren't, there wasn't any of that ground-up leadership that we had to stand and fight. I think if we had been there, if our folks had been there, we would have fought. And I think, that they, I think the Iraqi army would have fought. And I think now we've got to go back in and reestablish that leadership with him. Now, the, the, the strategy that the president has, and I voted to support this, uh, although I don't think it's about this is just my opinion. You can't I'm, I'm, a, I'm a former door kicker. I'm an infantry guy, okay? So that's what we did. We were, we're called ground pounders. We're down on the ground, uh, not up flying around where all those guys get to fly all those funny, those nice looking airplanes. You get to do the down and dirty work. That's all great to have air superiority. You can never win a war just with air superiority. You've got to have boots on the ground. Now, the idea is we're going to train up uh, the uh, moderates, whatever that is, in Syria. 5,000 of them, and it, what makes no sense to me is we're going to place them in between ISIS and, and Assad's military in Syria, and somehow these 5,000 people are going to do this. I don't see how that would work. The Kurdish people in the northern part of Iraq, and there are Kurds in, by the way, in Aleppo, a good many of them, and in Turkey, because that was carved out after the Ottoman Empire after World War I. Uh, that became part of Turkey. So it's really relatively new in the last hundred years that that, that land mass has been established. Those people are the same. So some of the Kurds are there trying to fight now on the very outskirts of Turkey, but they're getting no help really other than some air cover from us. How this is uh, all going to turn out, I have no earthly idea. Uh, I don't see a good landing for the way we're currently doing it. So be very interested in your opinions to see what you you all feel like and looked and thought about this, probably as much as I have where we should go from here. Congress uh, will act very quickly <coughs> when it comes to something as important as our national security. And you'll see a lot of partisanship get thrown out the window, I can tell you. You start looking at the safety of this country, and it's then we're all in this together because everybody gets harmed if we're attacked. Uh, I think uh, uh, immigration, I think that's an issue with our border security on the southern border. Look, it bothers me that, that a 12 year old can walk over here. Well, you know that good well that a terrorist can walk over here. So um, I think I'll leave that with ISIS. We can talk about that some more. And I do want to mention uh, just one thing uh, briefly. I got back from Vietnam uh, about three months ago. I had a lot of friends killed in Vietnam. So I had a real prejudice about. Uh, anything even made there. I mean, I pick up a, I like to ski, and I pick up a, a, a jacket made in Vietnam. I put it back. I don't care if it was on sale or whatever. I wouldn't buy it. Well, I thought, that's kind of stupid. I've owned a Toyota. We had a war with, with uh, Japan, so that makes no sense. So it was all emotional. Wow. It, wasn't, it wasn't rational at all, I can tell you that. So I get to Hanoi, and um, we, we go, they, they spent about 30 minutes they had set up for us to go through this communist museum. It was a bunch of uh, communist nonsense about how people all together tweet together and all that stuff. But you realize that in Vietnam now, two thirds of the businesses are privately owned. Uh, believe me, capitalism is thriving in Vietnam right now. So there are these four college students, all about your age, and we're walking along, and they're not looking at the pictures, and I'm not looking at the pictures. And I said, I said, son, I said, tell me 
what do you know about the Vietnam War? And he, he paused for a minute. I'm sure he didn't want to offend me or anything. He stopped and fought for a bit. And he said, well, sir, he said, we had to memorize a lot of dates and it was very boring. <laughs> and I started laughing. And I thought, this kid doesn't know any more about the Vietnam War than I knew about the Civil War. He said 70% of the population of that country wasn't alive at the time. So I said, what do you want to do when you finish college? I want to be a banker. And it dawned on me right then talking to that young man in Hanoi in a communist museum that he was looking out the front windshield and I'd been looking out the rear view mirror. I'd looking about what had. He was looking at the future. And I thought right then, I'm going to look at the future when it comes to Vietnam and how we assimilate with them because there are some very important issues in Southeast Asia, strategic issues called the Trans-Pacific Partnership that Vietnam very much wants to partner with their former opponent in America. They want to be like us. So I thought I would drop that off. That's why I want to hear what you got to say. The bowl I've done not spend a lot of time on. Look, as a physician, this is a very, very worrisome uh, disease. Uh, the reason it is, it has it is so lethal. Untreated, it's about 90%. Um, and we just had a fatality in, uh, in Dallas, Texas, as you all know, the first fatality here with Ebola that got back. And the other two folks that came back with Ebola were successful treatment. Look, I'm going to give you a little quick infectious disease course. Uh, one is, there's thing, a thing called the herd immunity. This is the herd I'm looking at right here. We all belong to this herd. If we're all immunized against a, a particular disease, let's say polio, and someone comes in here shedding the polio virus, that person with polio has no way to spread that virus because everyone in this room is protected from it. That's called a herd immunity. The disease will run its course, and if it's lethal, this person with it will die, but no one else in the herd will die. If only part of you are immunized, then part of you will get the disease and die. Right now, we have no immunization for Ebola. So how do you treat that? How, how do you treat a disease that there's, right now, there's no, there's no vaccine for it? Well, you have to do like we've, we've known about epidemics and outbreaks for a couple of centuries. We know how to take it. There's been the plague, uh, smallpox, and we know how to do that. What you do is there's a host and a vector in Ebola. The, the vector is, is a uh, fruit bat, and this fruit bat carries the virus, but it doesn't harm the bat. The bat can live with it just fine. It doesn't affect it like it does us. The bat then, through its droppings, affects other mammals. Those mammals come in contact with humans and humans then spread it by contact or bodily fluids. We don't think yet that this virus is aerosolized. And boy, I hope it doesn't mutate into that. Like a sneeze when you have a cold, and you have these little droplets go out and you can breathe them in and you get the cold virus. I, I hope it doesn't mutate. Right now, we don't think it has. So what you need to do is keep that disease isolating where it is. And I think we're doing the right thing by sending them. There's nobody better in the world at this than the American military is going to send them over to set up the infrastructure these, these poor countries do not have. And when you think of a hospital here, you think about Bristol Regional Medical or wherever your hometown is driving by your hospital. Well, a hospital in these countries may be a hospital without running water. It may not have electricity. That may be a, quote, hospital. So the basic understanding of the germ theory of disease these folks don't have, they don't have the infrastructure or the equipment to battle this very lethal disease. So in my opinion, the politically what we should do uh, or as a country is that we should limit travel. Look, it makes absolute sense to me. I do I think we could handle an outbreak in this country? Yes, no doubt about it. We, we have a social media to, to inform people. We can certainly uh, treat the disease as best we can, and much of the disease treatment is uh, just support. Uh, people get dehydrated, and then you get this cascade uh, where you then lose plate. I won't go through the medical part, but where you end up hemorrhaging um, and, and dying from that, and, and organ shutdown. We can prevent most of that, and I think we'll eventually develop a vaccine for this virus. But right now, the way you have any epidemic is keep it isolated where it is. You don't let the hosts and vectors get out to spread this disease. And so I think we should limit the travel from us going in, unless you're an essential medical personnel, and certainly people with those passports coming into this country makes no sense. And to check your temperature at the airport, I mean, it's, it's almost ridiculous because the, the disease can take up to three weeks to be symptomatic. In other words, you can be symptomatic in as little as two or three or four days, 
but it can't take as much as three weeks. You can be as healthy looking as we are. And yet, then you will come down with uh, this very, very virulent uh, virus. So that's what I would recommend we do from a policy standpoint until we can help control that and help the folks where they are. We need to send all the assets, and not just the United States, but the, civil, the uh, developed countries around the world need to be helping out. Uh, I think I'm, I'm going to stop there. Uh, uh, Ebola, is it scary for me? Yes. Um, I've got a, uh, a letter right here in my, from a physician. I got it last night, I'm going to call him today, who um, is a, uh, works in an urgent care center, runs one. And he is very, very worried about that virus getting out of what can happen. And, and if you look at it exponentially, it is scary. And that's why you need to keep it isolated where it is and, and again, get the treatment to the folks there. So I'm going to stop. And uh, we'll, we can talk about anything you want to talk about. So I'll just open it up. And first of all, thank you guys all for being here. Yes, sir. <clears throat> hey, we'll listen to you. So everybody can hear. Oh. I'll make you in charge of the mic after this. So if you just got a job since you asked for a break. Now there you go. Uh, you mentioned that ISIS was more of an ideological uh, movement. Uh, we've been talking about military intervention. What else do you think needs to be done? <laughs> what else do you think needs to be done to combat ISIS? You know, I think obviously, I think the solution is is that in, in, I mean, you see, I mean. The stories I've heard are just unbelievable. Our Christian families there, I, I talked to one, uh, that we have a, a prayer breakfast every year at, uh, in Washington. It's the first Thursday every, every February. And this year, I, I was sitting next to a man uh, who was the architect in Lebanon. He was in charge of putting, build, rebuilding Lebanon after it was just basically devastated by war. He pulled his iPhone out. And I saw pictures that were just unbelievable. And one story he told me was a Christian family that was brought out of their home by this by the ISIL. And their children were laid down and run over. They were forced to see them run over by vehicles to kill them. And then they were killed. They were forced to watch them. And this goes on, on, on. I think the people there going to have to be the solution. We can't solve that problem. We're viewed as invaders, as crusaders. It goes back, as you well know, to the Middle Ages. So the folks there have to be given resources. To, I think ultimately the sovereign across Americans can't solve the problem. And our democracy may not ever look like theirs. I, I tell you, the sad part for me is Iraq. It's a very wealthy country. It's 26, 7 million people. It's not like Afghanistan that has no natural resources. Iraq has the Tigris and Euphrates River. I've flown over that. You, you can see a fertile, I'm an old farm boy. I was raised on a farm. And I looked in there and I'm thinking, man, you can grow anything in there with the water you've got. They've got natural resources with all the oil you can pump out of the ground. So it should be a wealthy country. And yet because of this, the uh, conflict between the Sunnis and the Shias, it just has not been able to do that. What Saddam did was basically he was a minority Sunni, but he was able to keep a lid on it, I guess, just brutal dictator was able to do it. Uh, you would hope that uh, they could develop a parliamentary system as many other countries have done, as, as <coughs> Japan and, and Korea has done, uh, other Asian countries. I think Vietnam's headed that way. And look what's going on in China right now. I mean, in, in Hong Kong. Uh, even though the Chinese don't want to admit it, that, that little bud is beginning to bloom. So, what, what, are you, what are your thoughts? Well, uh, it's hard to balance with Bring it up a lot. Oh, sorry. I said it's hard to balance between the Sunnis and Shia. It's hard to figure out what to do with them because they always seem to be fighting about getting them home. Um, but I think that they should at least try and come up some middle ground, at least to some extent. Because uh, you, know, you saw Saddam Hussein, he was a Sunni, but he was a really brutal dictator, but there's at least some control. And right now, it's just absolutely chaos. Now, I'm not sure he was. Uh, he was a Sunni. I'm not sure he was very religious. No, I don't think so either, but <laughs> claimed he was. Uh, but I do have one more question now. That's about Ebola. Uh, to what extent do you uh, tell the people what they should know and what they shouldn't know? I mean, Ebola is a very nasty viral hemorrhagic fever. It's 
so I don't want to freak out the, the public by saying all the nasty things about it, but you want to at least be somewhat informative. How do you balance that? Now, I think you have to be honest with people. <laughs> As a physician, I have to sit down and tell people some really bad things sometimes. And I found out that the truth is always much better uh, because you have to develop a uh, trust. And I think certainly from Congress right now, we need to do, we need to, as a physician, I want to be uh, honest with people and tell them what this really is and how they can prepare for it, not to scare them. But yes, this is a terrible virus, but there are things you can do to help prevent getting that virus. I think the truth is always better. Just tell the truth. Tell people about it as best you, as best you understand the truth is. Yeah. So you're going to the football game in 2016, UT and Virginia Tech? Absolutely. Um, you bring up an interesting point when you're talking about how Saddam Hussein was uh, able to keep a lid on everything. Has America not, have we not kind of learned our lesson with uh, deposing these uh, secular dictators? So we, we keep basically either covertly or overtly supporting the overthrow of these dictators over there who are pretty much secular like Saddam was assuming, but he wasn't really that religious. Um, <coughs> keeps creating these power vacuums over there. Have we not kind of learned our lesson with that? Like, would it not be better to work with Assad who would, even though he's a dictator, he's, he's a pretty tolerant era of dictator um, in comparison to ISIL or al -Nusra. So would it not be wise to kind of work with him and basically keep the peace in the region, kind of stomp all this out, support him, or is that just something that's not being considered and it's like that is like a political suicide to suggest that? That's a great question. I, you know, I, I don't know the answer to that. I think, I think we are, as a free people, um, and um, I, I just sort of forgot about it, but I was on the trip to Korea and China. Uh, I went to China and uh, they put the, they had a little room in our hotel where we were so we could email our families and let them know we were doing well and so forth. So I think, well, you know, I'd like to go and if you want to be really entertained and you're a politician, read your Facebook page and you'll find out how really awful you are. Um, and I, I keep my mother's 92. I wouldn't dare let her read my Facebook page. You'd scare her to death. She wouldn't know who I am. So I, I write Phil Rowe, Facebook, hit the enter button, and the screen goes blank. And I realized, I, I, thought, I, thought the, you know, I thought it was a typical, the, the, the scourge of Bill Gates where Microsoft just crashed once again, but it turned, no, they had everything monitored. So they don't want any Facebook at all. And I realized in, then, in, in those societies, they limit the access to information, just like we're talking about. And we have lived in a free country for over 220 years, and we really understand as Americans what that's like. And you see people that are oppressed, and you want them to have the same opportunity. And look at, uh, look at Poland and look at Europe. If we had used that idea just to contain Hitler, you're correct. Once you remove somebody, there's a void left. Someone will fill that void. And sometimes it's not a very good people that do. We saw that happen in Egypt. We've seen it happen in, uh, in Libya uh, and on and on. And you're absolutely right, the Arab Spring. Uh, right now, we're supporting the, uh, in, in Egypt, uh, and we've been accused of supporting dictators. Remember that? Around, around the world. I don't know the right answer to it. I, I know that liberty and freedom is the right answer. And I hear, you always hear, well, those folks can't do that. And so I, don't, I disagree with that. Uh, Turkey has a, uh, a secular government, although it's being pushed. As you know, I've been in Turkey, talking to the leadership there, but it, it's a secular government. It's a member of NATO, biggest army in NATO is Turkey. And they're kind of caught right now because they have, and I've been in mosques in Turkey. Um, they're, they're kind of stuck because of the rise of fundamentalism. And, and if you think back historically, this is not unusual. I mean, we've had the, we've had the Genghis Khans and the Alexander the Greats, and we've had uh, movements that have occurred, and sometimes it's hundreds of years between them. I think this is just another one of those bubbles that's happening. It just depends on how a civilized world handles it. Answer to your question is a difficult one. I, I think supporting Assad would be hard for me, but who knows what will be there afterwards. You're absolutely right about that. Can I follow up on that? Yes, sir. Like, 
you know, the, the whole idea of bringing democracy to such a such a fundamentalist society. Um, the, what most Americans fail to realize is that you're not going to have a liberal democracy like we have here. You're going to have, I mean, there's a very real possibility that with a democracy in these uh, Muslim countries that they're going to elect radicals, democratically elect these militant Islamist you know, politicians who are going to come in and enforce these you know, oppressive laws on them. And then, so what do you do in that situation where you know, are you going to go throw him out of office? He was democratically elected. I think you. I think in the democratically elected, it is what it is. I mean, you know, we don't. I don't always get what I want when it's a democratically elected. <laughs> I might not like the current regime we have. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. You just mentioned that. Can you use a mic? He and I may be the only two in here. I've got a little twenty millimeter cannon problem. I'm still my hearing is not quite what it used to be. You just. You just mentioned that. If somebody is democratically elected, we just have to deal with it. But then how do you explain the 1950, 1953 Iranian coup by the CIA? 53, what now? The 1953 Iranian coup. Oh, you mean when we overthrew the, look, have I said, have we ever gotten, has America gotten it all right? No. But for the majority of the time, we have. And I, I can tell you that, that what, what every soldier, he'll ask himself this question, and he may not get an answer for a lot of years. It took 40 years for me to get an answer for me, but it, it was my military service worth it. Did it matter that I served? And I think he has asked himself that question. I got to Korea two years ago. When I was there in 1973, there was a military dictator there. I remember landing at the uh, airport there, and there were two guys with 50 cals on top of a tower when we landed and got off the airplane. It was 40 years ago. They were, they were getting themselves, digging themselves out of a war that literally leveled that country. I mean, it was the fourth poorest country in the world in 1960. Fourth poorest country in the world. Today, it's the 10th largest economy in the world. There are 50 million free, pe free people because of what Americans did. Look at Europe. Look at how Europe would have looked. For instance, I just read about the Battle of the Balls yesterday again. That had turned out different. If that war turned out different, would you have millions of free people? The Euro now area is larger than America, population-wise, all free. Would that have happened? Or were they, or they been in a uh, military dictator controlled by Hitler? And did we get every one of them right? No. Uh, I've actually talked to the Shah of Iran's son. He's been in and met with us uh, about what's going on in Iran now. But if it had turned out differently, we would have done nothing probably. Who knows how to for the majority of the time, uh, America's done the right thing. And we'll continue to do nothing. So we have to the microphone. Can I stop? Hello? Turn it on. Turn it on. So you talk about energy independence in the beginning. I guess one of the questions that a lot of the uh, energy we're getting now, a lot of the natural resources are pulling out some of the which is good because it's increasing what you say is energy, depend energy dependence. But are we uh, in danger of becoming a net exporter of natural resources because a lot of the refiners we have can't deal with the uh, crude shale oil that we're producing? And in the long term, won't that uh, actually damage domestic gasoline prices and prices for us? You mean exporting? Right, because with our refineries the way they are, they're not necessarily set up to deal with crude shale oil, which is what a lot of what we're producing now. And doesn't that put us in danger of becoming a country like uh, Venezuela, or a lot of other countries that export a lot, but it damages their uh, domestic uh, consumer prices. I think one of the things we can do, one of the reasons Canadians want to send us their shale oil is because we can refine it. And there are not many places in the world you can. And right now we're transporting it over rail, which is much more dangerous, as you know, than a pipeline. There are over 50,000 miles of pipeline in the United States right now. And they're everywhere. So I think the fact that we can that we can look. I think my grandkids who are 9 and 11 are going to be driving around the gasoline-powered car when they're my age. I doubt it. I suspect it will be some, some alternative. I, I'm almost sure it will. What it will be, I don't know. It will be nitrogen or whatever. I don't know. Hydrogen. I'm not nitrogen, but hydrogen. So I don't know what it will be or not. But I certainly know that right now, the reason you're not seeing 5 and 6 and 7 and $8 gasoline is because of the production of this country. 
And uh, I mean, you every think. I want you to think about this. And you talk about affecting you guys at your age. For every 25 cents gasoline goes up or down, it affects the U.S. economy by 35 billion dollars. So. Uh, Six years ago, five years ago, when I first went into Congress, five and a half years ago when I went into Congress, gas was $1.90 a gallon. Uh, it got up to $5 a gallon. And remember that a lot of that money goes out. For every dollar we send Canada, we get 80 cents back. Uh, you're going to see the Mexican oil production skyrocket. And one of the problems they had is because in their constitution, they wouldn't allow any outside investment in oil, in, into their oil fields. What was happening was it was a it was a government-run oil entity down there, Pemex, I think it's called, and they were using all the profits from that to prop up the Mexican government, so they weren't reinvested into new technology. And now that that reinvestment's going to occur, you're going to see oil production jump up. Our two biggest uh, trading partners are Canada. I mean, oil partners are Canada and Mexico, and Saudi Arabia sometimes is number three, but usually number four. The Keystone Pipeline reduces our need for, for uh, Middle Eastern oil by half. Instead of two million barrels a day, one, but we use 18 million barrels of oil each day in this country. And we get two million from the Middle East. We could be down to one million. You essentially would be off that. If it blew up in one way, it wouldn't, it wouldn't affect us. The other thing I think that energy is important, it has nothing to do with the Middle East, it has to do with jobs. And if you're energy independent, I believe this, my dad was a factory worker. And I think the way we've lost a huge number of manufacturing jobs in this country, one of the ways I think you get them back is a low-cost energy. Energy affects us more in this country because in, in Washington, D.C., where I live, there's great mass transportation because there's a huge density of population. But I explained to them, I said, where I live, mass transportation is F-150. That's how we get it. I can't catch the bus and go from here to of the train and go from here to Johnson City. I get, I walk to work every day, I take the metro. That's how I get around. But I can't do that here. I'd have been, I'd have been two days walking up here from Johnson City if I had to walk out. I had to drive up my truck. So energy is, is absolutely key, I think, to, and I think it's the way you help reestablish the middle class in this country. Let the huge other follow. Just one follow up. Uh, in terms of jobs, does it not feel like sometimes uh, when we put government spending is that jobs in the energy sector is jumping from one side to the next? There's still uh, complexes and job training centers in Fairbanks, Fairbanks, Alaska that are underemployed. None of the pipeline jobs that we came to. We put money in fracking and we need to list that as well. Can you speak up a little bit? Sorry. Uh, in terms of like, there's also dream of the pipeline in Alaska. Pipeline in Alaska. Uh, massive complexes and training centers and brand jobs that were come to the area that needed them. And now a lot of those complexes and those jobs never really materialized and a lot of spending from the government went into that. Isn't there a risk if you jump from one energy saver that makes energy independent and now it's fracking? Isn't there a risk that more money will be poured into areas, more jobs promised and they won't actually materialize because we'll be on the next thing? And there are going to be winners and losers every time and everybody won't get it exactly right. I remember Goldman Sachs was in talk. I'm on a, a little committee in Congress called the HEAT Committee, the House Energy Action Team. So we have these people come in, experts from around the country. This, uh, this investment guy came in from Goldman Sachs. He said, one of the things I've learned at Goldman Sachs is never bet against the engineers. He said, they'll figure out, if you can get all out of the rock, they can figure out anything. And basically, we, we, we have the largest carbon reserves in the world. We have to learn how to use our carbon reserves more wisely. I'll give you an example just up the road here, 20 minutes, is Eastman Chemical. They use 60 something carloads of coal every day. They need 13 carloads of high sulfur coal. They need the sulfur to make sulfuric acid, which they sell and use in the, uh, in the products that they make. So carbon is something you need to make. It's a building block for a huge number of products. But we also have to worry about the environment too. There's no question about that. Right, but it, it, let me just finish that thought. Right now, in, in metric tons, and I may up be off just a little bit, but there are uh, eight and a half uh, million metric tons of CO2 that China emits every year. If you put China, Canada, and the United States together, we don't come close to getting to eight and a half million metric tons. So we, we are doing a good job here. The problem is we've got to have help from developing countries, India and China, and they're more focused on developing jobs and they are taking care of the environment.
And there's a there's a happy medium you can do. I believe. You got one over here. No, I saw what they were going to do is start doing some health stuff. How in the world can you screen temperatures? Like I fly 150 flights a year, minimum. And I'm on airplanes all the time. If you started taking everybody's temperature and walk through an airport and then LaGuardia or something, good Lord, they'd be backed up way right across the Atlantic Ocean to try to get in. So it makes sense, it just makes sense to me, common sense to me, to limit the travel coming this way. And, and I think to go to those countries, I mean, it would be, it would be like to me, uh, you don't have to warn me to go into Syria now it might be dangerous for me. If I can't figure that out, I'm, I mean, maybe I should be shot. Uh, I mean, going to West Africa right now might be pretty dangerous. So I think everybody here understands that. Um, I think what we've got to do is keep that virus where it is and again, give all the medical help we can give to the people that Oh, yeah, here. Uh, in relation to the process, uh, 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 the government in California has a the border patrol and told them that they have intercepted a dozen ISIS fighters trying to cross the southern border. And then Homeland Security came out and categorically denied it. Do you have any information on whether that's true or not? Well, uh, he said that Duncan Hunter. Uh, uh, who is a congressman from San Diego, and I know Duncan very well. He sits next to me at the Education Workforce. He hates that committee, by the way. He tells me every time he's on there, I hate this committee. He's on the uh, Armed Services Committee. He's an he's a, uh, ex-Marine uh, who actually was a platoon leader that went into Fallujah and kicked the doors in. So he's, he's uh, uh, his dad was a Marine. He's a Marine guy. You know how there's a Marine Corps, by the way? The Navy needs somebody to dance with. That's what the Navy guys tell us. The Navy. So anyway. <laughs> If Duncan, said that, if Duncan Hunter said that, then I believe Duncan Hunter. I believe that's what he was told. He's an honest guy. Uh, he's a straight shooter if there was one U.S. Congress. And he's, he's about as an apolitical congressman as you'll find. He's a true patriot. He was told that, and Duncan believes that. And matter of fact, I'll call him when I leave here. I've got his number. I'm just going to call him. Yes. The question is, do you think, if, let me take what I would do if I were to do it in the Gulf Okay, what do we all try to do is, as a local politician, you're trying to get businesses to move to your community, right? I mean, you want businesses to come there so you can create jobs so you guys can get some work when you pay for this very expensive King College education, right? So you've got to have a way to do that. So if I were doing economic development, you know you have to have a landfill, right? I mean, you're going to have to have a place to put the trash. I would put, I would build a landfill, and very near to that landfill, I'd build me an industrial park. And you know what I'd say? Hey, you can move to my community, and guess what we'll do? We'll provide you free energy for the next 10 years. If you, if you're, you don't think that would move some people? In a heartbeat, if they knew they didn't, or I'll, I'll give you an example in Greenville, South Carolina, where the BMW plant came there to build a little, the two seaters, I, I think they built other cars down there now, 25% of their production, of their energy production at that BMW plant comes from the land. So, and it doesn't take that long to do it. I mean, we, I'll let me speak on the landfill just a minute. We did some other pretty neat things. You know, when you have uh, biosolids, when you, when you finish treating the waste, when it goes to the sewage treatment plant, there's a solid, the water that goes out looks like, I mean, it looks like a glass of water now that's that clean because of the Clean Water Act. But there are these solids, and used to, farmers would use it and, and put it on their fields, but you can't do that. So what we do is we transport that to the landfill because that biodegrades really quickly and produces methane. 
we recycle in Johnson City, and I, I mean, I wouldn't even think about taking a bottle and throwing it in the trash in my house. I mean, it, we, we put it in the recycling bin, and the reason we don't want plastic in our landfill is it doesn't operate. It doesn't it takes centuries to operate, so we separate it out. We want the stuff that's biodegradable, it uses methane very quickly. The, the um, project we did, we won the National EPA Award for the use of methane with that project, and it was the equivalent of taking 30-something thousand cars off the road or not importing 20 million gallons of gasoline. That's a big deal, what we did. So, pretty, pretty impressive. Yes, ma'am. Um, Could you use a microphone? Yes, ma'am. Um, now that it's in this country, um, are there studies being done about a, um, a vaccine? Or and what about the people who are already here? Are they being contained, contained, and not allowed? The answer. Um, let, let me go back to 9/11. Uh, one of the things that 9/11 did for us, uh, which was unanticipated, was that we invested a lot of money in our local uh, EMS, EMT, emergency responders. And I remember uh, in, in about 2003, um, I went, I got revaccinated for smallpox. I knew as a doctor, I probably would be one of the ones on the front line should a smallpox, should we, uh, and, and of course, as a, uh, a bioterrorism, smallpox is incredibly lethal. And we knew that the Russians had an enormous amount, and Saddam did have some until it was destroyed. He did destroy the smallpox that he had, so we knew that. So we knew good and well that we were going to have to, to deal with that. That investment that Homeland Security made actually turned out that when we have natural disasters, we've had a tornado and floods here. It worked very well. So we have a, an emergency system that can work. And we need to educate up our medical people to be on the lookout, to be more vigilant. There's no question about that. <laughs> Not just assume everybody comes in with nausea, vomiting, and fever that they have the flu. Uh, they may probably do have the flu, and, and yes, those families are isolated now and should do so voluntarily, but if they won't, they should be isolated. And so the way to pass it is body fluid, or is that the only way? As I said, so far we think that's the only way. Uh, it hasn't been shown to be aerosolized. There's one questionable case. They can't figure out how this one nurse got it. They just cannot figure it out. But probably she came into contact with something. The culture in that part of the country where you touch dead bodies, you, uh, and just the basic theory of, or having the ability to have soap and water and clean water, uh, doesn't exist. We take that for granted. When I mean, we turn the water on here, we drink it, we don't get sick. It's not the case in a lot of parts of the world. So the answer is yes, we can handle an outbreak here, but why handle it? Not like what do. Yes, sir. Uh, I want to try to turn the topic over to gun policy. We actually have a, a class here about gun policy. Sure, that's right. Saying, yeah. um, that's, what, that's what he was saying. That's what he did. Yeah. Dr. Robinson. He warned me already that you might ask that. <laughs> but he had mentioned that he had been at a handful of uh, colleges. And each one has had an issue with a gun. Um, maybe here last year we had an incident. Yeah. And um, we have a law currently that allows people with a concealed carry permit to have their gun in their car. What are your thoughts on maybe allowing some of the professors to get certified and be able to carry a gun on campus or uh, armed security guards? Uh, me personally, I have no problem at all with that. And me personally, I have a concealed carry permit. And the reason I do is that um, my first term in office, somebody threatened to kill me and my wife and my children. I took offense to that. That guy spent a year in, in jail. I've uh, since had two other threats since that time. And look, there are uh, <coughs> licensed people in this country. Law-abiding citizens are not the problem. It just hasn't been a problem. Um, you know, my wife has a concealed carry permit. My daughter has a concealed carry permit. My son has a concealed carry permit. We're not any, we're no harm. If I owned an M1A1 Abrams tank sitting in my front yard, I wouldn't be a danger to my neighbors. I would protect my neighbors. The problem with it is, is that that's not the problem in Washington, D.C. 
I sometimes get off the metro one, two o'clock in the morning. We work late into the night. I get off, and I got to tell you, I am. I don't have a security with me. I'm me. And and uh, maybe 40 years ago, I got whooped on some guys. I'm not so sure. Two, three guys jumped me now. And I can do that. And so they now uh, the courts have ruled that they have to allow that in Washington. I'm going to get a concealed carry permit for Washington D.C. When I walk on that metro at three o'clock and two o'clock in the morning. I get off, at least maybe I can get to my condo alive. So, answers to your answers, yes, amen, absolutely, if they want to. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, I'm noticing our mention is this or anything. Yeah, let him, because I think the other folks can't hear the question. Um, I've noticed in our nation's history, especially recent history, that um, Presidents have been able to conduct full-scale acts of war without seeking Congress's formal approval. Um, just want your opinions on if Barack Obama should be working on seeking Congress's approval and what has really happened to our founding father's idea and uh, war. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, um, first of all, I think he violated the War Powers Act. Really. Uh, there's no question in my mind. Uh, I think coming to the to the Congress and look, I think we need to to uh, have the debate on the House floor and the Senate floor, and I would vote to support the president and not support the president. We have that vote not to uh, obviously to extend that power to him, but not not to declare war. Uh, this is a war, really, and it's it's an amorphous war that nobody has uniforms on. But when people tell you, when a group of people tell you they want to fly the flag of, of ISIS over the White House, they declare war on you. And jihad is war. So I agree with you. I think we should I think we should have that debate on the House floor, listen to all the information, and listen to you all. I mean, I'm going to try to represent what the majority of the people I represent do, which is 700,000 people. Um, I, want to, I want to be sure that I represent the majority of you, and I think it should be debated. Agree with that, and I think he's going to have to come back to Congress within 90 days. Yes. Uh, that's a that's a tough one. Uh, I think probably in this case, uh, the, the uh, authorization to use of military force is probably enough because again, um, it, it's hard to declare war on something as amorphous as Al Qaeda. Where are they here? They're there. I think this is going to be a, a low level, ongoing war for a long time, for I think, unfortunately. If it were a city, if it were a state, that's different. Uh, if you were dealing with the state, I, I think, well, we haven't even talked about Putin in Ukraine and his act in it. And I think that's where you use, I mean, someone mentioned, I think back here, he's talking about the use of, uh, of uh, energy. Energy is a potent tool. Look, I mean, you meet Putin with your pocketbook. You make sure that the Poles and the Ukrainians and so forth have enough gas and oil to survive Putin. You cut his money off. And you don't have to fight anything. You just cut the money off. He can't do anything. So I think that's clearly what you do. And you use it as a tool. It was used on us. I saw it used on me 40 years ago. And so I'm ready to use it back. I'm ready for them to freeze and have their canteen freeze in the instead of ours. Good question. Based on something you said a moment ago. What do you guys think about that? I'm going to turn it around. What do you think on that? Uh, you get to answer the question. I think the president has been, the president seems to be aggressive since the Vietnam War, uh, taking military action. I would love to see Congress make declarations of the war in my opinion. Uh, okay, uh, I'm in um, national security law class offered here, and in the book it states that over, there's been over 300 acts of war by our country, and only, I think, 12 of them have been approved by Congress, or have, the President has gone to seek Congress's approval for that. So, uh, I, I think that's a very important issue. And well, there's a, there's a big debate. Look, there's this, uh, this tug of war between the President and Congress has gone off for 220 years. I mean, we've, about how much power the Constitution gave, and, we're, and, and that's what the lawsuit about with President Obama is about right now. It's very narrowly defined on the mandate. Don't, are you familiar with the lawsuit? Well, the lawsuit says this. The President gave an executive order to delay the mandate in the health care bill. 
So for, for the Congress has to prove to the court that we've been harmed or have standing. That's, uh, I'm not a lawyer, but that's apparently what you have to do. And there are legal scholars that say, yes, we believe you do have standing. What we're saying is the law of the land said on December 31st, 2013, this law went into effect that all people had to have buy health insurance. This is the uh, business mandate that was delayed. So it was a very narrowly crafted, well, can a president just unilaterally say, I'm going to ignore the law? And that's what this debate's all about. It's about the power of presidency. These total wars have been going on for a long time. And there have been a lot of executive orders issued. And, and the reason we have been able to get them in court is the courts have been very reticent to get in, in between the president and the Congress. They said, look, you guys figure it out. Well, now we're putting the court and hopefully going to make them make a decision about whether the president, I think he'll lose that. I don't think he can do it yet. But we'll see. Yes, over here, I've been looking to my right. See, I do that while I look to my right. Was that being said, what kind of precedent is that set for the decision of the for the decision of the jury? Well, what would that what would that set for future presidencies to kind of go around the law that was set for? His question is, what what does it mean for future presidents? I think it's a great constitutional question you just ask, and that is. <coughs> What are, the, what are the limits of power of the presidency? That's what this that's what this suit is really about. It's about what can the what can the president do? Can the president just usurp Congress when he signed the law? This is a law of the land. It said, look, if you don't like the law, that's what we got a Congress for. We can change it. The president can sign it. So this is really about a, a tug of war as it has been going on for a couple of centuries about how much power our presidents will push the needle as far as they can, and Congress is now pushing back. So <clears throat> it's going to be a great question. I hope the court takes it up. And the real question will be, and they have been very reluctant to do that, but the question will be, do we have, do we in Congress have standing? Will the court say that the Congress has actually been harmed by this? And we've had a bunch of legal scholars in our I've had some very liberal legal scholars who said, yes, we, we believe you have. So we're going to hopefully force the court to make that, that decision. Well, this has been a fantastic discussion. Unfortunately, our hour is up too quickly. Is there maybe one last question for the Congressman? Up top. Congressman, what is your position on providing direct military assistance to the Kurds in Iraq, Turkey, and Syria? And by the way, direct military assistance to the Kurds and Syria. Direct, you know, I think, I do know this, um, that the Kurds will fight, and probably they'll, they'll be an autonomous country, I think, in the future. And really, remember that the Churchill on a napkin basically put a rock together. It really wasn't a country. And that part of the world has been divided up like a bad pizza for the last 3,000 years. I mean, you've had every kind of occupation in and out over time. So I think, I think you're going to see uh, that the, the Turks don't want the Kurds to have a country. But I think ultimately they will. And I think we arm them up, they'll fight. The question I've got is, as I said, very beginning is I'm not sure you can get 5,000 people armed up and we missed the chance two and a half three years ago when this first started they had uh, they had Assad on the ropes there's no question about that but as he pointed out there was a void that was created and so what Al-Qaeda or basically ISIS moved in there and filled that void I think they, the Kurds will fight whether the others will I, I think the Iraqis will fight with the right leadership I think they will I think they'll take their country back uh, from these people. Uh, in Syria, it's a lot more complicated. I mean, you've got the Alawites, that's what Assad is. You've got all the other alphabet soup of bad guys. And then you've got these poor Christians sitting in the middle of them who are just getting slaughtered. So, courage, yes, the rest will come up. I, I want to thank you all for what a, what a great discussion. And uh, uh, thank you all for doing that. And, and uh, I would love to be in your classes and hear what you got to say. I really am interested in your opinion. I truly mean that because uh, it, it's going to, I certainly don't have the answers. I can tell you these are complicated, extremely complicated uh, questions and, and issues you all have talked about. And I, I've learned a lot today and if you haven't, we'll be glad to come back. And I certainly thank you for having us. Well, we thank you for coming.